House Judiciary Committee Chairman Jim Jordan has subpoenaed the company led by the daughter of the judge and former President Donald Trump's criminal trial in New York. The company is called Authentic Campaigns. It's the president's daughter, the president, or the, the judge's daughter is the president of the company. The subpoena by the House Judiciary Committee demands that the company, which does work for Democratic politicians, provide information about the daughter, Lauren Merchant's work at the company. And this will really catch your attention. One of the company's current clients is Vice President Kamala Harris' presidential campaign. Chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, Ohio Congressman Jim Jordan joins me. Good evening, sir. And why have evening, you Greg. subpoenaed this information? Yeah, well, we want to know what's going on because back in 2019, uh, 2020, authentic campaigns worked for both the Biden and Harris campaigns. Looks like based on public records, they got paid like $9 million. I think in one month alone, they got like $2 million from the Biden campaign, $7 million, I believe, from the Harris campaign. We want to know what's going on now. What, what happened in 23 when this case went before Judge Mershon? What was Authentic Campaigns doing for Vice President Harris, President Biden? What were they doing on the political side for them while the father of the person running Authentic Campaigns is presiding over the case against the, the people they're working for, political opponent, i.e. President Trump? Why is this the jurisdiction of the House Judiciary Committee? Because I actually think, you know, this is a very serious issue. And for the life of me, I don't understand the New York bar. They've been just sitting on their hands. I don't understand the judicial ethics in New York State. I don't understand anything because whether or not there's anything, you know, unseen, you know, anything bad about the judge's daughter doing, probably not, probably fits within the rules. It certainly has the appearance of impropriety or yeah. bias at a, at a highly political case. And I don't understand the New York bar. I don't understand the judicial ethics in New York. It looks like the fix is in. Even if it's not, it has it, it so smells to the American people. No, it sure does. And all kinds of legal experts like you have said that this is ridiculous. This judge should not have presided over this case. This judge didn't let Brad Smith, the expert on campaign finance, wouldn't let him testify. So we, we want to know all. But but we do this. We do oversight because we may need to propose legislation to remedy abuses that are happening in our justice system, i.e. a state prosecution going against a federal, someone running for the highest office, highest federal office there is, President of the United States. We passed legislation, Greta, out of our committee about a year ago that said, if you're going to go after someone running for president, if you're going to go after the President of the United States or someone running for that office, and, and it's a local prosecutor, that person, the, 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 the person running for the high office, should be able to move that to federal court. If that law were the law now, Judge Mershon would not have presided. This case wouldn't have been in that courtroom. It would have been in a federal courtroom. That's just an example of how uh, looking at what's happening out there can impact it and legislation we can propose. So um, we want to know what's going on here. We may need to propose some other kind of legislation, pass something else to remedy this situation, which anyone, I think, with common sense understands is purely political, purely political how this well, is operated if, uh, from the get-go. I mean, if that were the only thing, because think about this. May 30th, the jury returned its verdict of guilty. And at that time, uh, and, and since that time, President Trump still has a gag order on him. That judge hasn't lifted that gag order. The jury's long gone, and the judge hasn't lifted the gag order. I mean, what is with that? Then you've got the problem that the judge set the sentencing for, I think, September 14th. And the problem with that is, is, yeah. that, the, uh, is that the question, because you've got to consider all the issues coming down for the Supreme Court on its recent decision about what is, what is presidential immunity, what official acts or not. But here's the thing that annoys me about that. President Trump and Alvin Bragg have both said to postpone that sentencing date right. September. And I think it'd been several. And do you know that judge has not acted yet? And that is so routine when both parties agree to something like that. And the judge has not continued that date. And so it continues to hang over the president's head yeah. as, he, as, he does the, as he does the debate and approaches the election. I mean, why won't the judge just do what every judge in this country does when both sides agree on postponing a sentencing date? Because it's political. We know the answer to that question. But you're right, Greta. And both sides don't even have to agree. If one side says, let's postpone it, the other side says, okay, I'm okay with that. They may not want that, but they say they're okay with it. The judge will postpone it. But you're right. This judge will not do that. Because that's the situation right now. President Trump has asked to postpone it. Uh, Alvin Bragg has said he's, not, he's okay with that. Why wouldn't the judge do that? Because... I mean, if he doesn't do that, you can just see how political this whole operation is, underscoring why it, we it, did the it, subpoena today, and we want that information. 
Mr. Chairman, Absolutely. when the when Alvin Bragg said he didn't oppose it, it should have been a decision within 30 seconds. That's the way it's yep. done every single courthouse in this yep. country. All right, let me turn to one other thing. That's uh, you recently got a letter from the chair from the chairman of um, from Meta. Mark Zuckerberg, the chairman of, of Meta, which frankly I think they changed their name from Facebook to cover their tracks on some of this stuff. I would have changed my name too. But now we find out that they have censored people, and he admits it, and he says, "Oh, we own it. That's what he owns it." But what's he going to do to fix it? And, and what can you do about this? Because well, they were censoring people. Well, we're going to keep up our investigation. But he, he, uh, he admitted to four key facts in that, in that letter he sent us. One, he said the Biden-Harris administration pressured them to censor. Second, they, in fact, did censor. Third, he said, we also uh, throttled back the Hunter Biden laptop story four years ago this October which was a key story, them throttling it back, I think, impacted the election. And then fourth, and, and just as important as the censorship is, he said he's not going to spend the so-called Zuckerbucks on trying to have an impact on the election or help certain boards of elections in certain cities around our country. I think four key facts there. So this is, this is huge. I think the reason he did it is because we, in our investigation, had deposed, I think, 12 individuals from Facebook, from line employees all the way up to Sir Nick Clegg, I think number three at, at Meta, uh, former deputy prime minister of Great Britain, a big, big, has a big position at, at, at Facebook. Um, I think he knew we were going to keep going. And he says, let's just clear it all out and just state what, what happened. Uh, and then let's move on. But, so, but, but, uh, but he's did it. But it, be, what a coward. He's got all that money. What a coward. He did it three years late. He could have done this so much earlier. He could have talked about being pressured by the FBI. He says he's pressured by the Biden administration officials. But in that letter, what he says to you, he doesn't name them who they are so the rest of us know who these people are. This is a town of no consequences. This is where the government is basically doing very abusive things. And he doesn't have the courage to name who. I just want to know who's doing these things. And we, we ought to be able to know. Well well, we know it was our government. We know it was, it was people at the FBI. But the government, but who? But who? I mean, let's have some names. Individuals. We, we know it was, uh, it looks like Elvis Chan was involved with this, sitting in meetings with people in big tech, Elvis Chan working for the FBI and others. So we've deposed a number of people, and we're going to have more reports and information uh, from our investigation coming out. But uh, we do know we've made a difference because this has happened. We know that three weeks ago, Garm, discontinued operations, this outfit that was pressuring people, companies not to advertise on like Newsmax, not to advertise on, on certain platforms and websites of conservatives. They're no longer in business. There's no longer a disinformation governance board. They tried to, they tried to put that in place a couple years ago. So we know we're having an impact. And maybe well, the I biggest impact, Greta, is what RFK Jr. did last week. We had him in as a witness about a year ago. Democrats tried to kick him out of the committee, by the way. And, uh, his issue for endorsing President Trump is because of this censorship. That's why he's for, for Republicans now, for President Trump, because he knows we're the party that actually embraces and supports right. the First Amendment. Can you, can you explain to me why the 51 who signed that letter, using their prior uh, jobs, the 51 so-called intel, which are basically were surrogates for the Biden campaign, you had Anthony Blinken, Secretary of State, involved. You had Mike Morrell, who was involved. In, all of them Morrell signed that letter, and the, president, you, and the president used it at, at the debate with President Trump. Why do they still have security clearances? I mean, look, I got to tell you, I think they're much safer to the country than those 51, and I don't have a security clearance. No, and they have security clearances because it's the Biden administration, and there's been no one, uh, you know, the, the Garland Justice Department's not going to look into this. Only we are in Congress, but I don't know that they'll have security clearances when President Trump wins on November 5th. My guess is they probably won't. So this is, again, underscoring why 69 days from now is such an important date where we will, we, we, I think it's just critical that President Trump is back in the White House and not, uh, not more of the... Uh, the Biden-Harris uh, administration. Well, I'll leave the vote to the American people and to you, but I'll tell you one thing. I sure don't. I sure like uh, transparency, and I don't like all this funny business. But, I hear you. Um, yeah. I mean, anyway, you. Chair Chairman, George, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. You bet, Greg. Thank you.